Hi everyone, next up we have a story so strange that I'm not sure how to totally process it. It took place nearly three decades ago, and therefore some details are unclear, and the exact events have morphed over time. But basically, four siblings unwillingly unleashed a curse beyond their wildest nightmares. A childish prank that turned into something very dark and very sinister. So draw the shades and wrap yourself up tight. We're about to go on a crazy adventure. This all happened about 30 years ago in our small town in Massachusetts. We were the Terror Twins, tripled. Joel, Alex, and Robert, my three older brothers who dragged mischief behind them like a comet tail. I, Becky, the youngest, was their young and stupidly enthusiastic accomplice. Every broken window, every playground brawl, every confiscated toy, it all led back to us, a hurricane of laughter and chaos leaving a trail of exasperated adults in its wake. Mom, bless her heart, tried everything. Church was her weapon of choice, hoping the good word would somehow exorcise the devilry from us. We did our best to sit still for the hour it demanded, but the pews were like torture racks compared to the symphony of mischief waiting just outside the stained glass doors. Most folks in town knew us, their faces a mix of amusement and weary resignation, except for Mrs. Julia, that is. Mrs. Julia was the embodiment of a Halloween costume come to life. A permanent scowl etched itself onto her face, punctuated by a creepy and cloudy left eye and a prominent wart on her crooked nose. She wore black religiously, a walking shroud against the backdrop of our small, vibrant town. We couldn't imagine her ever being young, her face permanently creased into a disgruntled map. Whispers followed her like shadows. Mrs. Patterson would say, she was seen chanting in the woods, naked as a jaybird. Mr. Henderson would mutter darkly about graveyard dirt and potions. Mom, ever practical, kept her distance, probably figuring it was bad luck to mess with a potential witch. We, however, were fearless. Whenever we passed Mrs. Julia's ramshackle house, we'd erupt in exaggerated cackles, daring her to unleash some terrible curse upon us. It was a childish game, fueled by childhood naivete and a healthy dose of innocent curiosity. One day, Joel burst into my room, his face filled with excitement. Come see what we caught, he wheezed, dragging me outside. Huddled in the yard, my brothers stood guard over a hastily constructed cage, a laundry basket trapped under a pile of books. Inside, a ruffled crow squawked indignantly. Isn't it amazing? Alex yelled. We caught Mrs. Julia. I stared at the bird, then back at my brother, confusion on my face. You blinded a crow and called it Mrs. Julia? I asked. They exchanged a look, then Joel nudged the basket with his foot. Look closer, he said, a sly grin creeping across his face. I peered at the crow, its dark eyes gleaming with annoyance. It wasn't until they pointed at its left eye that it clicked. The cloudy white pupil mirrored Mrs. Julia's creepy eye perfectly. We were just playing soccer and it started attacking us, Robert chimed in, his voice full of conviction. Out of nowhere, this crow came diving at us trying to peck Alex's eyes out. It had to be her, Joel declared. No way a crow just attacks people. The logic was flimsy, but their enthusiasm was contagious. They were determined to prove their theory. We snuck the basket into the back shed, a dusty wooden building rarely used by anyone. The crow became our unwilling prisoner, its indignant squawks echoing through the cluttered space. Sundays at church became an exercise in anxious anticipation. We arrived for church, but Mrs. Julia was nowhere to be seen, and her pew remained empty. A week turned into two, then a month. Whispers began to take root in the pews. Was she sick? Had she moved? No one seemed to know. Finally, after a month of speculation, a rumor surfaced. Mrs. Julia had died. Relief washed over me momentarily. But then, a nagging doubt sprouted. My brothers, however, were ecstatic. 
One evening, Joel grabbed the crow and with a mischievous glint in his eye, plucked out a few of its feathers. He tossed it into the air, and the bird, surprised and happy to be free, took off in a flurry of black wings. Just as it disappeared over the fence, Mom rounded the corner of the house. Her face hardened with disappointment. What in the world are you doing to that bird? She demanded, her tone laced with anger. We scrambled to explain, but Mom wasn't having it. The lecture that followed was swift and merciless, leaving us grounded for the rest of the week. The following Sunday, dressed in our uncomfortable Sunday best, we arrived at church. My brothers exchanged knowing glances, their lips twitching with suppressed laughter. Then, through the church doors, walked Mrs. Julia. A collective gasp rippled through the congregation. She looked different. A bandage adorned her head, and a noticeable patch of her hair was missing, revealing pale, unblemished skin beneath. Her eyes, however, held a glint of something far more sinister, a flicker of recognition and a simmering rage that sent a tremor down my spine. My brothers, however, were oblivious. They erupted in a chorus of poorly stifled giggles, pointing at Mrs. Julia's missing hair. It was a scene straight out of our childhood games. Mrs. Julia's lips thinned into a terrifying line. Her cloudy eye seemed to focus directly on me, sending a prickle of goosebumps erupting across my skin. In that moment, I knew, with a chilling certainty, that we'd messed up. Big time. The following weeks were a blur of unease. My brothers, initially smug, grew quieter. Strange things began to happen. Joel, the eldest and usually fearless, tripped on the sidewalk one afternoon, scraping his knee raw and landing him in the doctor's office. Alex, who enjoyed a good night's sleep more than anything, started suffering from night terrors, waking up in cold sweats, babbling about unseen eyes watching him. Robert, always the athlete, fumbled a football catch during practice, twisting his ankle badly. Each incident chipped away at them, leaving them shaken. I, however, remained unscathed for now. One evening, huddled in my room with a flashlight under the covers, I heard a soft tapping on my window. My heart hammered in my chest as I peeked out. A single black crow perched on the windowsill its beady eyes reflecting the moonlight. It stared at me for a long, unsettling moment before launching itself back into the night. Terror choked me. This wasn't a coincidence. Mrs. Julia was sending a message, a grim reminder of the power we'd underestimated. The next day, I snuck out to Mrs. Julia's house. Fear threatened to paralyze me, but the image of my terrified brothers spurred me on. I peeked through a dusty window, catching a glimpse of a cluttered room overflowing with herbs, jars filled with unidentifiable liquids, and strange symbols scrawled across the walls. In the center of the room, Mrs. Julia stood chanting, her voice a low rasp. Panic clawed at my throat. I needed help, but who could I turn to? Telling mom about the crow and the witch wouldn't do any good. She wouldn't believe it. Suddenly. An idea sparked in my mind. The town librarian, Miss Finch. An older woman with an air of mystery. She was rumored to have an extensive knowledge of folklore. Maybe, just maybe, she could help us break whatever curse Mrs. Julia had placed upon us. With a deep breath, I turned and raced home, a flicker of hope battling against the ever-present fear. I wanted to find a way to stop this before it was too late. When I finally made it to the library, Miss Finch, bless her pointy-hatted soul, actually listened to my story. No scoffs, no lectures. There was a catch, though, of course. We needed an offering, something super special and irreplaceable. My stomach lurched. What would a witch want that I had? Miss Finch finally came up with a solution, a lock of my hair. Yeah, no pressure. Staring at my reflection, and with shaky hands, I chopped off a thick strand, and then we headed out and followed Miss Finch's instructions, performing the ritual in Mrs. Julia's overgrown backyard. 
It felt like the air was crackling with weird energy as I placed the hair on a makeshift altar. A crow was circling us before vanishing into the night, and then complete silence. Did it work? We waited for weeks, and a cautious optimism bloomed. The creepy stuff had stopped, the crows disappeared, and life went kinda back to normal. My brothers, shaken but okay, got their swagger back, though a little less cocky this time. However, there was still a tiny knot of worry in my gut, though. Sometimes I'd see a black feather fluttering in the wind, a reminder of the dark side that we messed with. It never left our minds and is still a constant echo of the day we underestimated a grumpy old lady, and maybe, just maybe, messed with something way creepier than we ever thought possible. It was a warm, clear night in early August when my buddy Mike and I decided to go on a camping trip in the mountains of Northern California. We had been friends since high school, and we made a point to get out into the wilderness together at least a couple times a year. This time, we had our sights set on a remote area that was known for its scenic hiking trails and abundant wildlife. We left Mike's place near Chico around 5 p.m. on a Friday, hitting the road and driving for about two and a half hours before reaching the trailhead. The last stretch of the drive took us down a winding, unpaved Forest Service road, but we finally pulled into the small, nearly empty parking lot, just as the sun was starting to dip below the horizon. We grabbed our packs and set off down the trail, our headlamps illuminating the path in front of us. The hike was a little over three miles, and it took us about an hour and a half to reach our campsite a nice flat area near a babbling creek. We quickly set up our tent and got a fire going, eager to relax and enjoy our evening in the wilderness. As the sun disappeared and darkness fell over the forest, we settled down by the crackling fire, sipping on some beers and sharing stories from our lives. It was peaceful, serene, exactly what we both needed. Eventually we turned in for the night crawling into our tent and getting settled into our sleeping bags. I was just starting to doze off when I was jolted awake by a loud thud, like something heavy hitting the ground just outside the tent. My heart raced as I strained to listen, trying to discern any other sounds. At first, there was nothing but silence. Then slowly, I began to make out the faint sounds of heavy, lumbering footsteps crunching through the leaves and twigs. Whatever it was, it was big, and it was moving closer to our tent. I held my breath, afraid to make a sound and didn't want to wake Mike and startle him. I was afraid that Mike waking up would snap the creature into attack mode. Maybe a crazy thought, but that's the way it went down for me. After a few minutes, I heard the footsteps stop, just a few yards away from our tent. For a long moment, there was complete silence. Then, a deep, snarl reached my ears. I carefully unzipped the tent just enough to peek outside, my hands shaking. The full moon was bright, bathing the forest in a ghostly silver glow. At first, I didn't see anything, but then, off to the side, I caught a glimpse of a massive dark figure lurking between the trees. It was huge, with broad, muscular shoulders and long, powerful-looking limbs. As it slowly moved into a patch of moonlight, I got a better look at its face. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. A flat, almost ape-like nose, small, deep-set eyes, and a large, wide mouth full of jagged teeth. The creature's hair was shaggy and matted, covering most of its body. I watched, transfixed, as the massive being lumbered through the undergrowth, seemingly unaware of our presence. It let out another low, rumbling growl, causing the hair on the back of my neck to stand on end. After what felt like an eternity, it disappeared back into the shadows of the forest, leaving an eerie silence in its wake. I remained completely still, my heart pounding in my ears, waiting to see if it would return. But the forest around us was still, the only sounds being the gentle babbling of the creek and the occasional chirping of crickets. Eventually, 
exhaustion overcame my fear, and I drifted off to a restless sleep, the memory of that terrifying encounter weighing heavily on my mind. When I woke up the next morning, Mike was already up, sitting by the remnants of our campfire and sipping a cup of coffee. I debated telling him what had happened, but a part of me was worried he would be equally terrified and angry that I didn't wake him up. I mean, what I had seen simply didn't seem possible. A creature that massive, lurking in the woods of California, it sounded like something straight out of a fantasy novel. In the end, I never told him. We packed up our gear and headed back down the trail, the uneasy feeling of being watched never leaving me. But in front of him, I pretended to have thoroughly enjoyed our trip. To this day, I'm still not sure what that thing was that I saw that night in the forest. All I know is that I'm just moving along as if it never happened, and wondering if I'll be able to head out there again when our next trip comes around. Hi, I'm writing in with a story about what I think was a dogman that harassed my family for a while in our hometown. I'm from Galloway, Ohio, although it's technically not a town. It's just southwest of Columbus, Ohio. My dad is a pediatric surgeon in Columbus, and I'm going to college at Ohio State. I'm a junior now and decided after my freshman year to live on campus, even though my family's home is close enough that I could commute. I like the freedom and it's easier for me to make friends and keep up with classes if I'm on campus. My mom wasn't thrilled with this at first, but my sister still lives at home and I was going home almost every weekend for dinner and to do laundry for free like every college student does. When I moved in my sophomore year, my mom decided to get chickens as a hobby. She's been a stay-at-home mom since my sister was born and once we were old enough started volunteering for church but I think she was feeling a little restless around that time. She started off with three chickens and a small coop, but eventually convinced my dad to get a flock of 12 and expand the coop. My mom loves the chickens and definitely pampers them. Sometimes I'll even stop home on weekend mornings for egg sandwiches. I was just starting my second semester of my sophomore year when my sister Jenny called me and told me that my mom was really upset because two of her chickens had been killed. Jenny said she thought at first it was a neighborhood dog or a fox, but the weird thing was that the whole chicken was gone. My parents' neighbors also had chickens and the same thing had happened the same night. They'd dealt with foxes before, but said foxes usually left most of the chicken behind. In my mom's coop, there was just a bunch of feathers, and the chicken was missing. It definitely looked like there had been a struggle, and Jenny said the feathers were almost in a straight line out the door, and I could tell over the phone she was weirded out by it. I shrugged it off as nothing serious and suggested they get a motion light out there and just make sure everything was secure. Jenny was quiet and then told me that they'd already checked around and everything seemed perfectly secure. There were no holes, no ways in, and the door to the enclosure was shut and locked still. That was weird, but at my age, I didn't care so much, so just changed the conversation. A little over a week later, I went home for dinner and could tell my mom was upset. She told me that she'd lost another chicken the night before, and they were now down to seven plus one rooster that I hated because it always came after me. I tried to joke around that it was too bad whatever it was hadn't taken the rooster, but my dad gave me a look that told me to be quiet, so I did. I found out later that their neighbors had experienced the exact same thing on the same night, again. At this point, my dad and the neighbor were highly doubting it was a fox. Four chickens total between the two houses had been taken, and that was way too much for a fox to manage. My dad's colleague suggested a trail camera, so he bought one online and set it up when it arrived a few days later. Jenny was keeping me up to date with all of the happenings via text. And since my classes that semester were easy, I found myself intrigued by what was going on and waiting for updates. I'd actually seen the trail of feathers the weekend I went over for dinner and agreed privately that it was weird. It looked almost like someone had plucked the chicken while walking away, leaving handfuls of feathers at even intervals. There also hadn't been blood anywhere. By now, it was about midway through April, and for almost two weeks, nothing happened. 
I kept going home for dinner and expecting updates, but it all seemed calm and quiet. And then one morning, my dad called me. That was strange because we usually only texted and he was always busy with work, so it was more of a check in than a conversation. But I could tell as soon as I answered that something had him upset or excited. He was talking quickly and it was all about the chickens. I made him slow down and repeat some of the stuff I hadn't caught. He told me that the night before, something had taken two more chickens. When my mom went to feed the chickens that morning and realized she got my dad, who was about to leave for work. He took the trail camera to work with him and had time before his first surgery to check out the photos on his computer. What they showed was the reason he was freaking out. He was texting me the photos as we talked and I put him on speaker to look at them, thinking he must be wrong. But the photos showed some kind of dog, creature walking on two legs. It definitely had a muzzle and sparse hair all over its upper body, with the hair getting thicker around its legs. The feet were huge and almost human-like. It was hard to tell from the camera, and because they were shot at night, but the thing must have been at least five and a half to six feet tall. There were only a few photos that showed it. The dog creature walked into the frame on two legs and its eyes were shining reflexively. In the next frame, the enclosure door was open and the thing was crouching kind of out of the frame. In the last photo, it was walking away with two chickens in one hand. It had a sort of cropped tail, but the back looked very human and very muscular. Dad said my mom was really upset and he wasn't sure he should show the neighbors the photos. We talked for so long that I ended up missing my first class. We both agreed that the thing must have been able to actually unlatch the enclosure door since it had human hands and went inside and just picked up whatever chickens it wanted. And it was plucking them when it left, which was why the trail of feathers was so perfect and bloodless. Eventually, my dad had to go back to work and I had to get to classes. I was thinking about it all day, but didn't talk about it with anyone. When I went home for dinner two days later, my dad pulled me aside to tell me he'd deleted the photos and told my mom it was just a fox. He wasn't going to say anything to the neighbors either, and he ended up putting a combination lock on the enclosure door. My mom thought that was weird, but I think she knew something was up and was too afraid to ask. Soon after that, the chicken stopped being taken, but our neighbors would still lose one or two every few weeks. To this day, I've never said anything to my mom or sister or anyone else. It's weird knowing that there's a dogman creature out there walking around in Ohio, but there's no point in being scared, I guess, since it's never gone after humans as far as I know. Just chickens. Sometime back in October, I was on a road trip with some friends, and we were traveling through Wisconsin. We are all from Michigan, but we're on a trip to visit all of the Great Lakes. And at that point, the only one we had left was Lake Superior. On our way there, we were also visiting some of the nearby nature, reserves, parks, and forests along the way so that we could also hike and camp. We had this planned out for months. I think we started planning it at the beginning of that year but we had been discussing it for years before then. So anyway, this was something we were super excited about. We also planned on visiting some of the more local attractions like museums and such. Sometimes we'd ask locals for recommendations or advice for our travels. Well, one night my friends and I are out walking around one of the towns and we meet an old man. We got to talking to him and told him about our plans and where we were headed. He then proceeded to tell us about how he did something similar with his friends when he was our age and that he wishes us the best and for us to stay safe. But then when we mentioned we were going to hang out at Lake Superior and possibly camp there for a few days, he got all weird. He kind of became aggressive and strongly advised against staying in the area past dark. His face became pale and his hands became shaky. There's something evil that lives up in those parts, he said. You'd best not be out past dark when you're there. He would not elaborate when we asked more, and he also began to slur and mutter a bunch of gibberish. So my friends and I assumed he was just crazy. 
We told him thank you for the advice and politely got ourselves away from the situation. At the end of that night, we were driving to our hotel and this is when the weird things began to happen. The road was dark. We were the only car there at that point and it was a little foggy. Visibility was low. As we are driving, the ride is silent because we were all tired. Well, out of nowhere, the driver curses, hits the brakes and swerves hard to the left. There is a thud and we see a shadowy figure collapse to the ground. Scared, we all stumbled out of the car, but there was nothing there. The hood of the car is dented as though we had hit something and there was a little tuft of fur stuck to it too. Then there was this smell of rotten meat that just hovered over us. We looked for a while but found nothing and eventually we convinced ourselves we must have hit a deer that jumped off the side of the road. So we got back in the car and continued driving. A few days later, we had pretty much forgotten about the past weirdness and we made it up to Lake Superior. We were staying at the Knife River campground. After we pitched our tents, we went down to the Knife River Marina Beach. We spent the day swimming and hanging out. It was a lot of fun. Then nighttime came along and we spent time around a bonfire, telling stories and roasting marshmallows. I have no idea what time it was when this happened, but I know it was pretty late. One of our friends decided they had to go to the restroom and waddled off into the bushes to do their business. The rest of us continued our conversations until a few minutes later when our friend came sprinting back to the campground. She was pale and shaky and very freaked out about something. We tried to calm her down, but she became more hysterical, telling us to put out the fire and get in the vehicle. She was now screaming that there was a monster in the woods. Just then, this thick smell of rotten meat filled the air like cheap cologne. And along with it, we heard a low growling noise coming from behind the trees. Our friend screams and tries to drag us away, but we just stare at the spot where the noise is coming from. At this point, we were hoping it might just been a stray dog. At least that's the thought that was going through my brain. But then, from behind a dense cluster of towering trees, there slowly emerged a creature that can only be described as a gigantic monster. And I choose that word with extreme care and deliberation. Standing easily seven or eight feet tall, it was an awe-inspiring sight that left me completely confused. Its overall appearance was eerily reminiscent of a werewolf. And yet there it was, right in front of my very eyes. Upon closer observation, the monster was standing on two legs, similar to a human. Its legs were thick and supporting an upper body that was unnaturally muscular, almost as if it had been carved with the perfection and precision of a sculpted bodybuilder. Covered in a dense layer of gray fur, the creature's skin underneath seemed to ripple with sheer power. Its long snout filled with rows of sharp, gleaming teeth protruded menacingly, adding to the terror of its appearance. The face of the creature was uniquely horrifying, bearing a strong resemblance to a demonic German shepherd. Its ears were pointed and alert, and the teeth, already mentioned, were sharp and seemed capable of tearing through anything. But what was most unsettling were its eyes. They were dark, blank, and empty, void of any discernible emotion or intelligence and yet somehow seemed to pull you in. And then, in a moment that seemed to freeze time itself, I swear to God, the corners of this beast's lips curled upwards and it smiled at us. It did this with a smile that was both fascinating and utterly terrifying. We began to scream and push each other and tried to run away, but we just kind of stumbled around. Then, it hit me. This was the same smell the night we hit something with the car. I felt my heart stop when I realized this. The creature howled and that broke us from our trance. We ran as fast as we could to the vehicle and got out of there. We had no idea where we were going. We just drove until we could no longer see it chasing us in the rearview mirror. The next day, we all discussed what we had seen and had no idea what to think. We had all seen and smelt that monster there was no way it wasn't real. But at the same time, I do not believe in the supernatural or werewolves or anything like that. None of us did. We cut our trip short and began our journey home that morning. At some point, we had to stop to get gas and we bumped into that old man we had seen at the bar nearly a week ago at this point. 
trying to be slick, we asked him if he had ever seen anything strange up at the lake, and he paled in response. You've seen it too, he asked quietly. Scared and shocked, I nodded in response. Then count yourself lucky to be alive, he said gravely. We haven't been back to Wisconsin since.